This is Science Friday. I'm Flora Lichtman. Ira Flato is away. Later in the hour, we'll be talking about a post-apocalyptic world ruled by threatening biotech. That's from Jeff Vandermeer's new novel, Born. Do you want to talk about your favorite apocalypse scenario? Then give us a call. Our number is 844-724-8255. That's 844-SCI-TALK or tweet us at SciFry. But first, new research into a chemical compound that increases endurance without actually having to exercise at least if you're a mouse. Reporting this week in the journal Cell Metabolism, scientists flipped a particular genetic switch in mice, and the mice ran 70% longer, 70% longer than control mice without any physical training. So what does this mean for your workout? Can we all say goodbye to our pump-up playlists? Let me introduce my next guest. Ronald Evans is an author on that study. He's also an investigator at the Howard Hughes Medical Institute and a professor and director of the Gene Expression Laboratory at the Salk Institute in La Jolla, California. Welcome back to Science Friday, Dr. Evans. Thank you. Great pleasure to be with you. So, Dr. Evans, one of the things that I thought was so fascinating about this study is that we actually have a gene pathway at all for endurance. Is that true? Um, Yes, I mean, we do have a gene pathway for endurance, um, and that's really what a large part uh, of the study is to try to understand. How many Um, genes are in it? You know, it's not a, a, a specific number, although we do describe the genes that we see. It's, it's minimally several hundreds of genes, um, and it's probably a, a few more that get dialed in with parallel pathways, depending on what you call exercise. So exercise is a term that does not actually express something specific other than a process of what you do leads to better performance of what you've been doing. But you can have walking can be exercise for some people, a fast walk can be exercise for others, but it might not be good exercise for a Lance Armstrong type person. Mm. Um, and so yoga for some people is exercise. But at the uh, performance level of endurance athletes, uh, then they are taking exercise to the human physical limit, for mm. example. And mm-hmm. so there's a whole range of what you might call exercise. And the underlying feature is that we all plug into the same genetic pathway. And I think one thing for the listener is that exercise, as soon as you do that mechanically, activates a set of genes in your muscle. Mm. That's very important. And so the fact that that happens uh, means that if we understand what is the controller of that gene network, then we might be able to actually hit that controller, that master regulator. But that's ex- and that's exactly what you found, right? The controller that's exactly for that. That's exactly what we found. That, exactly. Yeah. So how do we hack into it? What did you do? Well, nature of the hacking was not simple, actually, <laughs> because when you want to hack the genome, it's like you need the right algorithm to to access the set of genes that are normally not being activated. And the master, really the ringmaster of this, is a sort of uh, type of molecular software uh, we call PPAR Delta. That's very That's, catchy. It's the name of it, I know. It's, it's not a great name. But it, it is a sensor for fat. And it, it lies in the nucleus of the muscle cell. And when fat is pouring in to burn as energy, uh, some of that goes in and hits the sensor. And the sensor actually has a set of algorithms that reprograms the hardware of the genome to marshal up the genes that are needed to burn fat. So the so this secret, is how it happens in when you're actually exercising, it's, right? It's what's happening when you're actually exercising. Okay. And we discovered this sensor actually embarrassingly in some ways back in 1995. This is the arc of when we didn't know what it did, but we discovered it. Um, and it turns out it is the master regulator of this pathway. And because it likes to bind fat, and that's what turns it on, and that it, it in turn plugs into the gene network and is the coding for the activity of those genes, those exercise genes, we developed a drug that mimics fat, uh, but is not fat, it's a chemical, uh, and it gets into the body. Uh, it's orally active, and 
Uh, so you can take fine. it. You can take it fine. as a pill or something. You can take it as a pill. Mm-hmm. Finds the sensor um, and uses that to activate the genes without any exercise. And um, what does it actually do? Like, how does it make you, ha- or how does it make these mice, right, have greater endurance? Well, so it does two, there's two things that happen, and that's, that's, that's the great question that we were addressing is a little bit, what is endurance, number one? It's actually not what people think it is oh. uh, from, from a scientific point of view. Um, and I think of how- it as being able to, you know, exercise longer. Yes, and, and so, but training uh, progressively allows you to run. Let's say you're running or cycling or swimming or doing some kind of endurance uh, challenge. The training will progressively and incrementally increase your ability to do it longer. If you or I, if you're, are you a runner? In the past, In I the have past. been. Because, okay. because. <laughs> Because <laughs> runners know that if you just get up and start running, you're gonna you're gonna hit the wall relatively soon. I can t- if, I can test I can testify to that. You yes. will poop out. Um, and part of the paper, and really the big scientific underpinning of this paper, is what is hitting the wall. Uh, and this is the event that terminates the run or a race or the cycling for athletes. You see it happen all the time in the Tour de France when even lead. Uh, uh, athletes will hit the wall, and they just drop to the back. You cannot overcome that process uh, in any simple way when it happens. And we're trying to understand that because endurance is progressively moving the wall to make it not be in your way. Um, and as you move, right, the wall, it's not scaling the wall; it's pushing it's the wall back. The wall. Yeah, yeah, okay. It's not, not scaling the wall. Um, and this wall is Mexico is not paying for this wall, um, but the the point is that uh, the the when you hit the wall you become disoriented uh, and you're uh, overtaken by sudden uh, and overwhelming fatigue, uh, often dizzy, um, and your your race is basically over. So does this gene pathway help you move the wall? Yeah. So this is the pathway that actually helps you move the wall. And what we found is that endurance uh, and all the training that you do is really about moving the wall. And so then he said, what is the wall? And, and so the wall is actually a sugar wall. Um, and that's part of the interesting science. It's long been known that, um, that if you deplete your blood sugar by any means, below something like 70 milligrams per deciliter, you become what's called hypoglycemic, that is low blood sugar. The brain only lives off sugar. That's how it keeps going. Muscle can burn sugar and fat. So muscle has two sources of energy, but the brain only has one. Mm, mm -hmm. If you're going to burn a lot of energy over a long period of time, you have to have your brain staying along with your muscle. And because the brain only burns sugar, progressively to move the wall, that is to allow your brain to keep going. You have to burn more fat. You have to burn more fat and burn less sugar. The less sugar you burn in the muscle, the more there is for the brain. The more you give to the brain, the longer you can run. So does this gene pathway let you burn more fat in your muscles? Yes. So it lets you burn more fat. It's one of the big benefits. It lowers your lipids in your blood, it burns fat from your adipose depot. You know that long distance runners and cyclists tend to be skinny uh, because they have very little fat. Um, And so it transitions uh, the energy stores in your body, which you were were using the stored energy in the body uh, to both drive muscle and to keep the brain going. But the point is how you shift the ratio of the usage of the nutrients in the right way is the secret to moving that wall and gaining the endurance. And the surprise of the science here is that the longer the brain stays active, the longer you will be able to run. And so um, it's more about the brain and sugar than we previously thought. Um, And we describe the actual genes and the events that go on that preserve the sugar. And it turns out there's a specific set of of 
events that happen is sugar gets burned in athletes in a I think what a, I think what people are going to really want to know is like can they take can they take a pill that will activate this pathway and let them burn more fat while they're exercising and get past the wall like is that what's coming next yeah so I would say that's a good question that, that is what's coming next next and so while the study here was with mice um, and the mice remarkably sedentary mice that uh, receive this uh, the drug that we use improve their performance by 70 percent which is a very big number huge um, yeah it's huge um, that um, the goal is now quickly transition this into people and there's a, actually a company in Boston uh, that is taking this on they're called Mito Bridge uh, and I do consult with them just to be clear <laughs> Uh, and they've developed a new form of the pill for people, as opposed to the one that we used for mice. I heard there were some side effects to the the chemical used for mice. Yeah, so the, the chemical used for mice is not a good drug for people. We'd call it a dirty drug. On the other hand, the uh, the country of Russia actually built a center and made this drug and gave it to their athletes, has been giving it to their athletes, for uh, uh, based on our work. For some time, and the two things that we learn from that, and we have about that, twenty seconds, just so you know, that, that it ha does improve performance, but it's also not safe. So the safe drug is now being formulated. It's in a pill form and should be coming going to trial relatively soon. So we're very excited by that. That's really fascinating. Thanks for joining us today. My pleasure. Thank you. Ronald Evans is an investigator at the Howard Hughes Medical Institute and a professor and director of the Gene Expression Laboratory at the Salk Institute in La Jolla, California. When we come back, Jeff Bendermere is here. We're going to talk about his latest novel, Born. Support for Science Friday comes from Blue Apron. You know, springtime is a great time to hit the reset button and retackle personal goals like getting fit, cleaning, and cooking. And luckily, Blue Apron makes incredible home cooking easy by delivering seasonal recipes with step-by-step -step instructions and pre-proportioned ingredients right to your door, all for less than $10 per meal. You can even customize your recipes based on your preferences and select the delivery option that's right for you. Plus, there's no weekly commitment, so you only get deliveries when you want them. And they are featuring some of my favorites this month in May. There's beef teriyaki stir-fry with sugar snap peas and lime rice. Three cheese and baby broccoli stromboli with tomato and oregano dipping sauce. And crispy salmon with roasted potato salad with pickled mustard seeds. Mm. So check out this week's menu and get your first three meals free with free shipping by going to blueapron.com slash science. You will love creating incredible home-cooked meals with Blue Apron, so don't wait. That's blueapron.com slash science. Blue Apron, a better way to cook. This is Science Friday. I'm Flora Lichtman. What seems scarier? The idea that humanity could one day snuff itself out or that we could mostly snuff ourselves out, but in the process create an almost unlivable world for the remaining few. The latter is the scenario we find ourselves in in Jeff Vandermeer's latest novel, Born, where a future world has been wrecked by ecological disaster and misguided technological development. The story is told by a woman named Rachel, and in the book, Rachel survives by scavenging in an unnamed, heavily polluted city. That city's under siege by a bear the size of a three-story building. The bear is biotech gone wrong, the remnant of a defunct firm known only as the company. But then one day, Rachel finds Born, a cephalopod-like creature that pretty soon begins to speak. And Rachel raises Born like a child. And suddenly, this dystopian world is just the backdrop for what becomes a pretty pretty relatable family drama. My guest today is Jeff Vandermeer. He's the author of the Southern Reach Trilogy. His new book, Born, is out now, and he joins me in the studio today to talk about it. Jeff, welcome to Science Friday. Thanks very much for having me. So uh, would you tweak my description? No, I think that's a great description. <laughs> oh, good. Uh, the, the, the main <laughs> thing, I think, is that uh, you know I truly 
came at this from kind of a science fantasy point of view. I, I really wanted to deal with biotech uh, in the moment and the way Rachel would see it and not necessarily explain everything about it. Um, although there are some explanations for the flying, for the bear at, at a certain point. Well, yes. tell us about the bear. I love well, the bear. <laughs> well, I think the bear comes from two impulses. One, I read Angela Carter's Nights at the Circus, where she has a flying woman in a circus that she never explains. and You never see any wires or anything. And I thought that was amazing. <laughs> And then Richard Adams Shardick, which has an amazing, brutal bear in it. And I read that as a teenager. And I've never gone back to it because I don't want to, you know, ruin it or anything um, <laughs> or have it influence me too much. But um, And then bears in general fascinate me because they're, they're large predators. They are omnivores, but th that have thrived, you know, despite the fact that we've had all these problems with climate change and ecological loss. Well, I wondered, um, because this takes place after, there's a climate change reference. We know mm -hmm. that Rachel mm -hmm. lived on lived on an island and their rising seas were a problem and then she and her family became refugees. And I wondered if the bear, this evil bear, mm -hmm. is like revenge of the polar bears. <laughs> <laughs> I think that that, that, that definitely uh, is, is a possibility. Uh, it's one of the things on my mind. It's just the, the, the adaptability and non-adaptability of certain animals. Um, there's also a Hanukkah bear in that my, my stepdaughter, when she was seven and I was trying to learn about Judaism because I had just come into the family, <laughs> uh, did this whole spiel for 20 minutes about a Hanukkah bear and the constellation it was, and it was completely fabricated. But I then went up to the <laughs> rabbi at our synagogue and actually told him the story of the Hanukkah bear, much to my embarrassment because she was laughing in a corner. But that's, there's one scene on a rooftop with the bear flying against the night sky, and that's kind of where it came from because I was thinking about this bear constellation. Oh, so <laughs> this came from the mind of your stepdaughter. My, my stepdaughter is responsible for a lot of early born uh, in, <laughs> in, in the book. Not later born, but there's a, like a moment when uh, born says long mouse when he sees the ferret, and that's something that my daughter said when she was a kid. Bourne had the best moments. Oh, thank you. I loved Bourne. <laughs> thank you. Describe for listeners what Bourne is. Well, Bourne is kind of a terrestrial uh, uh, cephalopod slash sea anemone that kind of grows and grows and begins to talk. Rachel finds him before he begins to talk, but he, he emits kind of a smell that reminds her of her childhood home, of the salt and everything. And you wonder later whether that was manufactured because uh, he is a product possibly of this company and he may have been made for a particular purpose. So. And so he's and he becomes bigger and bigger. So mm -hmm. he starts at this sort of like a plant like yes. <laughs> li an enemy like thing. And then it's slowly revealed that he has many other powers. Yes. He's not just a wallflower. He can kind of change shape a bit and he can kind of assimilate a bit from what he learns around him. So he's kind of kind of like a kid and then like a teenager. But you know, very different and, you know, kind of scary sometimes and sometimes not. Um, I loved hearing about <laughs> Rachel raising Bourne. Yeah. And, like, I just felt like it was... It was such a funny way to learn about parenting and read about parenting because it was so absurd in many ways. Like it's in this like very dystopian world. Yeah. But I wondered if you were drawing from your own parenting experience. Definitely. And that's one reason why I wrote the book when I did, which is I needed some time to think about what it meant to <laughs> have been a stepdad and uh, my relationship with Aaron and kind of all the tricks we played on each other. At one point, we had an iguana that didn't really exist. When she didn't want kids to come over, she would say the iguana had gotten loose and mm. Um, but anyway, so um, so definitely that's that's in there, and I wanted to have this personal drama against this backdrop because too many times in uh, I think post-apocalyptic literature, you you don't see the moments of connectivity, you don't see the moments when people try to be their better selves, and I really thought it was important to kind of portray that because I really feel like there's a real complexity even to a post-apocalyptic situation. Well, I actually felt like that it was sort of the anti Lord of the Flies in mm. a way. <laughs> Thank you. That, I like that actually. <laughs> oh, good. <laughs> but it, because you think when I started reading it, I thought this is. I was like, this is actually refreshing because it's mm -hmm. like the only thing darker than the news right now. <laughs> but then it actually became, it yeah. was clear that it was much more, a much more optimistic story. Well, I think I, what I what I want as a corrective is I always want to make sure in my books that hope is earned, um, that it's not a false hope, that you're not trying to give the reader a false conclusion. But I, I felt like um, Rachel struggles so hard and she pushes so hard and she's so earnest and, and I think a, a, a nice human being at base that it's, it seemed like a book that would have more hope in it just because of that. Mm. You Did you bring a passage to read? Can we have you read a little bit? Sure, I can. And, and so, you know, Bourne has learned how to speak, and he's become fairly uh, large. And uh, Rachel's recovering from being attacked by someone from outside of uh, her sanctuary, and she gets to know Bourne better. And so at a certain point, Bourne is restless, and he wants to go out into the world. And so she begins to show him the world. Okay. 
I took him to the balcony out on the cliffs too, but that was a little harder because I felt Bourne needed a disguise to be safe. I found a flower hat with just one bullet hole and a brown blood stain to match. I found a pair of large designer sunglasses. I had the choice of putting him in a blue sheet or a black evening dress that I salvaged from a half-buried apartment. The evening dress was moth-eaten and had faded to more of a deep gray, but I chose it because I had nowhere to wear it and it was several sizes too big for me now. So Bourne reconfigured himself to be a little longer and less wide than usual, sucked in his stomach more or less, and put on this ridiculous outfit. But it wasn't complete enough for him. What about shoes, he asked me, and I regretted having gone off on a rant about the value of a good pair of shoes a couple of days before. You don't need shoes. No one will see your feet. Probably no one would see him, period. Everyone wears shoes, he said, quoting me. Simply everyone. You even wear them to bed. It was true. I'd never gotten over having to sleep in the open so often. When you slept in the open in dangerous places, you never took off your shoes. Bourne really wanted shoes. He wanted the full ensemble. So I gave him shoes. I gave him my one extra pair, which were really the boots that I'd come into the city in. He made a great show of growing foot legs and with his hand arms reached down to put on his new shoes. From the aperture at the top of his head, muffled by the hat, came the words, We can go now. But if Bourne wanted the full ensemble, I wanted the full human. Not until you grow a mouth, I said, and a real face. The transformation took only a second. All of his eyes went away, then two popped up where appropriate, and a nose protrusion that looked more like the head of the lizard he had eaten a few hours earlier, and a kind of crazy grinning mouth, in that hat, in the black evening dress, in the boots. He looked so earnest that I wanted to hug him. I never for a second understood the gift I'd given Bourne. We went out, out onto the balcony. Bourne pretended he couldn't see through his sunglasses and took them off. It's beautiful, he exclaimed. It's beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. Another new word. The killing thing, the thing I could never get over, is that it was beautiful. It was so incredibly beautiful, and I'd never seen that before. In the strange, dark sea blue of late afternoon, the river below splashing in lavender and orange up against the rock islands, the river looked amazing. The balcony cliffs in that light took on a luminous deep color that was almost black but not, almost blue but not, the jutting shadows solid and cool. Bourne didn't know it was all deadly, poisonous, truly disgusting. Maybe it wasn't to him. Maybe he could have swum in that river and come out unscathed. Maybe, too, I realized right then, in that moment, that I'd begun to love him. Because he didn't see the world like I saw the world. He didn't see the traps. Because he made me rethink even simple words like disgusting or beautiful. That was the moment I knew I'd traded my safety for something else. That was the moment. And no matter what happened next, I had crossed over into another place. And the question wasn't who I should trust, but who should trust me. I love that moment from the book. Oh, thanks. Yeah, that's, that's actually really, <laughs> you're not supposed to cry at your own passages, but uh, it's really been difficult for me to read that. So I've been reading it over and over again to make sure I get past that point, because it's unseemly to cry in front of your audience. We welcome crying here. <laughs> okay. Feel free. <laughs> Feel free to let loose. Um, but no, it's very moving. And it captures what I really enjoyed about the book, mm -hmm. which is that you have this sort of horrifying mm. element and this soulful element mm -hmm. and also silliness oh, all at once. <laughs> and I wondered if that if you think about that balance. I do. And it's something that was really hard for me to achieve in my much earlier work, um, because when you're learning how to write and getting some kind of mastery, you're mostly focused, or I was, on being serious. But I do have a sense of humor, and I did want it to come out. And, and I, I, I don't like books that are monotone. I, I want, you know, life is more than one thing, no matter how harsh it can get. Yeah, that comes through. Our, if you want to talk to Jeff, our phone number is 844-724-8255. That's 844-SCI-TALK if you have questions about Born. Or if you just want to talk about your own apocalyptic mm -hmm. future that you're interested in. Um, I wonder if we, there are so many interesting creatures oh, yeah. in this <laughs> book. Like it's chock full, like salamanders rain from the sky. Yeah. You've got this giant bear that's prowling around, flying around. I had this vision of you um, like thumbing through field guides, but what was your actual process for <laughs> inspiration well, for the I've, creatures? I've studied biology in an amateur way for a long time, and so there's been certain creatures I, I just become fascinated with, and I just study them in an amateur way for a long time, and I was surprised. Like what? Well, the salamanders, for one, um, which are actually the focus of the next novel, um, and at one point it was fungus and squid I was focused on, and then it was meerkats, um, although I didn't realize that they were so small, and in, in another novel I had them at four feet 
feet tall until I saw them in perspective and realized they were tiny. Um, <laughs> and um, now, of course, it's bears. Um, I used to get a lot of dried squid in the mail from fans because of the really? squid stuff. Um, I actually created a, f- a fake freshwater squid as part of a story and got in a lot of trouble with the city of Sebring because of that, because I had the festival set there and the Chamber of Commerce was getting phone calls. Um, so things like that. So I get fairly, fairly obsessed with the animals. There are 120, I counted them, finally, animals inborn. <laughs> Do you have a taxonomy somewhere? I have a bestiary that uh, the publisher is going to put online of 35 of them. I couldn't handle doing all 120, <laughs> um, you know, and some of them are things like silverfish. One's a duck with a broken wing, uh, which turns out in the bestiary not to actually be a duck. So when you see that in the novel, don't, you know, be, be wary of it. <laughs> <laughs> I loved the biotech little animals that appear in a flashback. Mm. They're like mm-hmm. little chicks or something. Yeah, and they, yeah. they are from this more benign time. Yeah. You know, things are sort of starting mm-hmm. to go wrong. Yeah. But I wondered, are you worried about biotech in particular now? Are there mm-hmm. inventions that you're concerned about? I think as we begin to experiment more and more, there's this, um, this co- uh, kind of corruption of the idea of animal versus product. And so the company is basically creating products that are in animal form. And so I do think we have some ethical problem uh, uh, issues going on that we have to think about. Like what? What are you concerned about? Well, I mean, you know, I do. I am a believer in animal rights in, in part because, uh, you know, it's it's not that I, I believe in animals over humans. It's that I believe that their fate and ours are inter, interlocked in part because of habitats and, and the fact that we need to preserve the, the wilderness out there for our own survival as well. But they're the ambassadors, and we haven't quite worked out a relationship uh, with them. And as animal behavior scientists uh, can tell you, more and more we're seeing that we understand, uh, you know, animal intelligence as being more advanced, maybe not like ours, than we thought. You know, bird brains we've just discovered are, are twice, have twice the p- capacity that we thought, for example. Mm. Mm. So. I'm Flora Lichtman. This is Science Friday from PRI, Public Radio International. Let's go to the phones. Mason in Columbia, Missouri. Do you have a question? Yeah. Hi. Thanks for having me. Sure. Uh yeah, and uh, Jeff, congratulations on the new book. Oh, I thought Annihilation was terrifying, by the way. Oh, thank you. I'll take that a as a compliment. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Great book. I look forward to the new one. Um, so just in thinking about a, a world where if there's just a small fraction of people left mm-hmm. to live uh, in the face of some huge apocalypse, I think about uh, electromagnetic pulse, uh, the EMP that either comes naturally for this, from the sun or can be emulated by a, a nuclear warhead a couple hundred miles above the atmosphere. That sounds terrifying. Yeah, it is. <laughs> and it, uh, that essentially shuts down all the electronics within a, a huge thousand-mile mm-hmm. radius, anything that's not solid state, so mm-hmm. cars, refrigerators, uh, computers, you name it. So uh, that's a scenario that kind of terrifies, uh, terrifies me, and I, I was wondering if you've ever uh, tackled anything like that in your writing. I, I haven't really tackled that. Um, I, did, I do think that, that certain images can stand in as metaphors for things. Like, for example, the giant bear in, in Bourne, you know, it, it's literally itself, but then also figuratively, it kind of stands in for the dislocating thing on the horizon that upends your world. Um, you know, it, it might as well be a giant bear, whether it's that or a nuclear uh, d- disaster. It just simply overtakes your world and, and, and kind of re- reworks your brain, I think. Thanks, Mason. Thank you. One thing I really appreciated about the book is that you have a lot of strong women characters. Oh, thank you. <laughs> it was told the main character, the storyteller, is a woman, Rachel. And I wondered if you had a process for, mm-hmm. if it's different, writing for a woman, writing for a woman's voice rather than a, yeah. It, it, it just really depends, I think, on, on the circumstance. I, I need to know the character just, I just need to know the person as much as possible, but then I have to think about the certain kinds of constraints that many women face just going through their daily lives um, and try to be as true to that as possible. So, you know, she's in this relationship with Wick, this pioneer in the, in the book, um, which is a fraught relationship for a variety of reasons. Um, but there's also other dangers and things that she thinks of that are totally invisible to Wick. Right. Did you identify more with Rachel or Wick, especially when it comes to, to parent, to child rearing? I, I think with Rachel because, you know, you could say in some ways later in the novel that some of her trust in various things is misplaced, but I think that that's still our better selves. And I, I see Rachel as a fundamentally decent, but also kind of hard-edged person. And I really admired her. And it was very easy to write in that voice after a while, just because I knew what she would do in any circumstance, basically, I thought. So the the book paints a dark picture mm. of the future. <laughs> <laughs> Are you optimistic about our future? 
You know, I'm optimistic uh, because I know there are so many people that I meet, you know, when I go around, uh, I speak at environmental conferences sometimes and stuff, and I see the passion the scientists have, and I see how many people who are experts are working so hard on these problems, and so I have a lot of hope. Really? Yeah, I do. I do. And uh, in part, it's also because of the fact that I think that, you know, it's not going to descend into militias. I do think that there will be pockets of resistance and things like that. And I, I'm heartened by the resistance I'm seeing right now. Um, so I'm, I'm hopeful that our better days are ahead of us. But I do think that we have a lot to overcome to get there. Before we let you go, do you want to give us a, any kind of preview of the sal- our, the salamanders that are in store for us in your oh, you next mean book? Yeah. Yes, I'm working on a, a book called Hummingbird Salamander, in which a woman discovers is given a key to a locker with a taxidermed hummingbird and salamander in it, and it descends her down the rabbit hole into eco-terrorism, wildlife trafficking, in a kind of near-future so- uh, situation. All my favorite things. Of course. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Jeff. Thank you. Jeff Vandermeer is the author of the new sci-fi novel, Born. After the break, the ocean still contains many mysteries, including a tiny transparent creature that builds a house made of mucus. It can filter 20 gallons of seawater in a single hour. More about that after the break. Support for this podcast comes from Tile. What if you could find anything in seconds? Well, now you can with Tile, the tiny Bluetooth tracker that makes finding your things easier than ever. You simply attach Tile to your keys, your wallet, your laptop, even your bike, anything you don't want to lose. Then when something is misplaced, find it easily. Just open the free Tile app on your phone to see your lost item on the map, then quickly find your item by making your Tile ring and it'll be back in your hands in seconds. And if it's your phone that's missing, just double press on your tile to make it ring, even on silent. Every day, over 2 million lost items are located with tile. So join the millions who have used tile to help find their lost stuff. Get yours today at gettile.com Friday and save up to 30% per tile on a multi-pack, plus free shipping. And because tile makes the perfect gift, For a limited time, get a free gift box with a multi-pack order. Go to GetTile.com slash Friday. That's GetTile.com slash Friday. This is Science Friday, and I'm Flora Lichtman. And now we visit with a creature you definitely should know about. It's the giant larvation, which is pinky-sized but giant for a larvation. It's translucent, it's an invertebrate, and it has a huge footprint made of mucus. Yes, these little creatures build elaborate, gooey homes up to three feet across. They use this mucus to catch food, filtering bits of detritus out of the ocean. And now researchers have an idea of how much water they sift through in a given day. Just one giant larvation can filter up to 20 gallons Per hour. Monterey Bay's community of giant larvations can filter all the water around them in less than two weeks. You can see a video of these giant larvations at work on our website, sciencefriday.com slash mucus, appropriately. And all of this has some exciting implications for their role in marine ecologies and carbon cycles. So here to tell us more are my guests. Dr. Kakani Katija is a principal engineer at the Monterey Bay Aquarium Research Institute in Moss Landing, California. She's the lead author on the new research. Welcome to the show. Thank you very much. And her co-author, Dr. Bruce Robeson, is a senior scientist and midwater ecologist at the same institute. Welcome, Dr. Robeson. Hi, Flora. Thanks. Kakani, I want to know everything there is to know about giant larvations. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> Where do you want to start? Um, well, you know, we'll be... here's, the, here's the thing that first caught my interest. They're pinky-sized, but they're a type of plankton. Is that right? Right. Um, well, so by definition, plankton is essentially, you know, an organism in, in the ocean that just drifts with the current. And so larvations are, I think, exceptional of the plankton in that they create these really elaborate mucus houses. And as you said earlier, those houses serve to, you know, separate food and particles from the water around them um, and do so by concentrating all of that food. Um, and what's really interesting is, you Before know, Before you animal, go on, I want to give people a visual image of these mucus sure. houses. So what do they look like? That's a it's hard to describe. Uh, it looks a little bit like a diaphanous cloud, uh, and imagine that that's just 
basically built by, you know, creating strands of mucus. Um, and, you know, if you were to take these things out of water, I mean, it looks like a snot ball, essentially. Um, but in water, <laughs> you know, they're just, I know it really is delightful. But I mean, in water, they just have uh, so much complexity to them. They look like they have different chambers in them. Um, and they all play a role in, you know, essentially feeding this organism. Where can we find these larvations, these giant larvations? Well, we can find them really easily in Monterey Bay, and I know that there are also reports of them in other oceans around the world. I'm sure Bruce, Bruce has something to say about that. Sure. They've been reported from the Atlantic, uh, the Indian Ocean, and all through the Pacific Ocean. The issue is that while we know that they occur in, in many different places, we have no idea of how abundant they are in, in other parts of the world ocean. In Monterey Bay, they're quite abundant, and we've measured that and reported on it in this paper. What's curious uh, and of interest to us in the future is, are these patterns of abundance that we see here reflected elsewhere in the world ocean? And they, you know, mucus houses aside, and I actually do want to talk more about them, but um, they ha they play an important role in the ecosystem. Is that right? They sure do. Um in a number of ways by filtering out particles uh, from the water column in order to feed. They select a certain size range that's appropriate for their, their mouth and their, and their digestive system. Anything larger than will fit into a relatively small animal is uh, excluded by the outer filter of their house. And that means all of this big stuff uh, collects on the outside of the filter. So when the animal um, has passed enough water through the system that uh, the outer filter becomes clogged with these big particles, the animal just swims away and builds a new house. The old house collapses on itself and compresses into a, a relatively dense package and sinks very rapidly to the seafloor. And then it becomes a snack. Maybe more than a snack. Oh. A big meal for a lot of animals that live <laughs> on the bottom. How important is that mucus house to feeding those bottom dwellers? We think that it, it's quite important because it's high-quality nutrition. Most of the detritus that sinks out of the upper layers of the ocean and goes down to the deep sea floor sinks very slowly. And as a consequence, it can be decomposed by microbes on the way down. Mm. These discarded larvacean houses sink really fast. So instead of taking a month or more to reach the deep sea floor, um, the sinkers, as we call them, get down there in a day <laughs> or two. If you have a question about mucus houses or giant larvations, you can give us a ring, 844-724-8255, 844-SCI-TALK. Kakani, you built a device to help us understand these mucus houses better. Tell us right, about it. Exactly. Uh, well, so my background is uh, I'm an engineer, and uh, one of the things that I've done or spent several years doing is uh, studying fluid mechanics. And so there's a technique that's very common uh, to laboratory measurements of fluid mechanics. Um, and what I wanted to do was you know, take that technique and reapply it in the oceans, you know, where the organism or where the system you're interested in studying uh, will be. Um, and the reason for that, right, is, you know, you can imagine the ocean is a fluid world and, you know, understanding the physics of that motion in that fluid world or in nature is really important. And so this instrument we call deep PIV uh, really was a result of that uh, whereby we can affix this instrument to a remotely operated vehicle or an underwater robot and look at these kinds of questions, you know, maybe relating to larvation feeding or something else. This is like when I really love science, when we build tools to help us understand mucus houses. You know, <laughs> this is so awesome. Exactly. Uh -huh. <laughs> I, I, I appreciate it. I'm sure other people do too. Did you imagine that that's, that's what you, those are the kind of tools you would be inventing? You know, it really is often a question of the science question as well. Um, I think I was more shocked at 
uh, you know, how successful it has been. Um, because when we started the development of the instrument, I think that was the summer of 2014, and within a year we were deploying uh, the first version of this instrument uh, on a remotely operated vehicle here. And so that's a really rapid cycle of, you know, development and then building and then deploying. Um, so it's been a really, you know, wonderful experience then seeing for the first time, you know, what the instrument then reveals uh, when you're looking at something like a larvation house. Why can't you just pull the, the larvation out of the water and study it in the lab? Well, I'm sure Bruce could speak to this too, but I guess for years, scientists have been collecting giant larvations and actually bringing them into the lab. Um, but because they make these mucus houses that are really sticky, and these houses are quite large, right? They're on the order of a meter across. It's difficult. In fact, they haven't been able to get them to replicate and build homes or houses in the lab. And so because of that, we essentially were driven to try and develop some technologies that will allow us to study them in their natural environment. Because I guess scooping them out, the, the mucus house just turns into a glop of mucus? Essentially, essentially, yeah. It just balls up and then it can't separate, the walls can't separate from each other. And what does the tool actually do? What are you looking at? How fast the water is filtered through? Or what were you trying to understand? Essentially, yeah. So uh, in, the instrument really is made up of a, an imaging, uh, you know, an imager, so in our case, a high-definition video camera, and a light source, uh, which in our case is a, a laser with uh, some optics that changes the laser beam. You know, think of a, you know, a laser pointer you might use with your cat. Uh, <laughs> but instead, you know, instead <laughs> of a single beam, you'll have something that looks like a sheet, a sheet of light. And so what we're seeing or what we're capturing when we shine the sheet of light on larvation, let's say, uh, is that, you know, the gelatinous or the mucus tissues light up in the laser light, um, but also the ambient suspended particulate uh, that's present in the ocean. And so we can actually track the motion of these particles um, to infer the motion of fluid around these animals. Bruce, how often do giant larvations make these homes for themselves? Like, how often are they cycling through homes? We're pretty sure that they make, make about one each day. What? We did, yeah. We measured them in the water column for more than 20 years, counting the number of, of active houses with animal filtering away, and how many were sinking um, as abandoned houses. And over a 20-year stretch, it turned out that there was about one active house for each sinker uh, each day. <laughs> and so the math is pretty simple. It looks like on average they're building one house a day. This seems like a like a, an existential kind of torture to build <laughs> your house over and over again every day. But the bottom line is that it works. And <laughs> Mucus is pretty cheap stuff. Just, well, uh, I was I was wondering where does all that's a lot of mucus to produce. These houses are three feet wide. That's true, but mucus is mostly water. It's mm. sort of held together with a, a mucopolysaccharide kind of uh, network, and so it's really cheap to build. And again, these animals wouldn't be doing it this way if it were inefficient. Obviously, it works because. It's been that way for quite a long time. How does the mucus house, um, so it feeds animals at the bottom, but does it also impact the amount of CO2 that's sequestered by the ocean? We think that it, uh, it certainly does impact and have a, a positive influence on CO2 sequestration because the carbon in the organic material that these animals are filtering and, and eating um, is derived from CO2 uh, that's absorbed by uh, phytoplankton at the, uh, at the surface. And they incorporate the CO2, or the, the carbon from CO2 into organic material. And then the larvations package it up and send it to the deep sea floor. So in essence, they are taking CO2, rendering it into uh, organic material, and sequestering on, a deep, on the deep sea floor, far from uh, the atmosphere. 
I'm Flora Lichtman. This is Science Friday from PRI, Public Radio International. So, Bruce, should we just be stocking the oceans full of larvations to deal with climate change? I think we shouldn't mess with Mother Nature that way. <laughs> um, ask the people in Hawaii what, whether or not it was a good idea to import mongooses to take, <laughs> to take all of the rats that were in the, co- in the, in the cane fields or the, the uh, gardeners who brought in kudzu from Japan in order to be an ornamental plant. Fair point. If it's, it's totally fair. I mean, are they threatened in any way, though? Like, do, do we have to worry about their, their role in the ecosystem? So far as we can tell, there appears to be no uh, negative impact on them uh, that we can see. There are some indications that as the ocean gets warmer and thus has less oxygen in it, they may be squeezed closer and closer to the surface in which circumstances they build smaller houses, which uh, can't load up and carry as much carbon away from the, uh, from the surface layers. But that's mm. just an indication. We've really got no way to test it yet. Are there any other outstanding questions about the giant larvation and its mucus house? Wow, where do we start, Bruce? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, I can say um, uh, from an engineering standpoint, um, what really interests me with these organisms is, is their house. Like, how do they build these homes? You know, these are very intricate structures and also very complex. Um, there's also differences between these structures uh, as you look at different species of larvations. You know, we're working with giant larvations, but the smaller larvations, the Oikoplura, also have a lot of vari- variation. Um, and so, you know, obvious questions, too, if you think about it in terms of bio-inspired design or bio-inspiration, you know, if these might be models for really efficient or effective filtration systems, and maybe that's something that we can learn from. And so, you know, developing these tools to, you know, investigate these complex structures uh, in the ocean is going to be really useful and important for us to address some of these questions. Very cool. Bruce, you, any other, any questions that you are still hoping to answer about these creatures? Well, Kakani put her finger on it. The the (laughs) big question is, how do they do it? We can see that, basically, it appears that the animal extrudes uh, a glob of mucus and then pumps it up. But that means that the complex structure within that filter has to be already uh, built into the mucus blob that the animal inflates. How do they do that? I can't wait to find out. (laughs) Neither can we. (laughs) (laughs) I want to thank you both for taking time to be with us today. Kakani Katija is a principal engineer at the Monterey Bay Aquarium Research Institute in Moss Landing, California. Bruce Robeson is a senior scientist and midwater ecologist there. Thank you both. Thank you, Laura. You can help Science Friday appear, prepare for the um, upcoming solar eclipse this August. We have a short quiz up at sciencefriday.com slash quiz. B.J. Lederman composed our theme music and our thanks to production partners at the studios of City University of New York. If you'd like to write, please send your letters to Science Friday, 19 West 44th Street, room 412, New York, New York, 10036. You can also email us. The address is science. The address is scifry at sciencefriday.com. And you can find me on my show, Every Little Thing. That's Gimlet Media's geeky new podcast, and you can get it wherever you get your podcasts. I reflate.